grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with us. You will have to forgive me for walking up here a little bit late. I, someone asked me uh, how, how my son did in the football game yesterday in Louisiana, so I, I got a little long-winded. <laughs> Long story short, uh, as I told him, we were able, uh, Southwestern Pirates were able to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory uh, in the fourth quarter. So it didn't end up the way we wanted, but, uh, but uh, that, that little boy of Cindy's uh, <laughs> played a nice football game, got him a touchdown. I think he had the hardest hit. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, catch me after the worship service and I will go on and on. Uh, better yet, it, well, if you catch Cindy after the worship service, you might not get home for lunch. So uh, she's kind of proud of her little boy, too. Um, welcome to First United Methodist Church, to our um, fourth Sunday in Lent. And, uh, you know, we got the time change. Uh, I'm grateful I have a little clock here that I, that I keep um, that I neglected to change the time on last time. So it's correct again. So I'm happy about that. Um, and I was thinking, more, this is probably more um, relevant to our 8.30 service, uh, but in the Catholic Church, often the priest, there's a, there's a particular service or two throughout the year that the priest will walk through um, with holy water and, you know, flick holy water on the congregation, and that, maybe that should be done on uh, daylight savings time, time change, to keep folks awake. I don't know. But uh, it is, uh, I mean, this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So um, we will, I'm sorry too, you've got me the entire service. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I slip out and go preach in our Ignite Contemporary service, but Pastor Ryan is on uh, spring break vacation with uh, his family. So um, Carrie Hendricks is preaching in the Ignite service today, and I say that in case anyone wants to um, uh, go on to the Ignite Facebook page uh, sometime after worship in here today and, and catch uh, Carrie Hendricks' message. So uh, you're welcome to do that. But let's focus on now. I invite you to stand uh, for our call to worship. Join me in the call to worship, please. From near and far, you have called us. The Lord is our shepherd. You have brought us out of darkness into the light. We who were dead have been brought to life. We who were lost have been found. If you'll join us in our hymn, please, it's printed in your bulletin.
You may be seated. Let us pray together. God of immeasurable grace, you meet us in our time of need and cause your face to shine upon us. You sent your Son into the world that we might be saved, and you fashioned us into vessels of your love and light. Redeem us this day, O oh God, that we may be found worthy of the one who came to bring us life. Amen. Amen. And I would invite you uh, to join in the prayer of confession uh, today. Would you join me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to a time of personal silent confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Okay, let's pray the uh, prayer for illumination together, please. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first reading comes from Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. People spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. <clears throat> so pray to the Lord to take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look up at the serpent of bronze and live. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel reading this morning. It comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3, and we'll begin at, uh, where are we beginning today? Verse 14. We almost started in chapter 2. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, John's, John's uh, Gospel, chapter 3, begins with a Pharisee named Nicodemus coming to Jesus under the cover of night. And what we read in the Gospel reading is part of this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is prominent. He's a, he's a leader among the Jews, and he and Jesus have this time together where Jesus is explaining some stuff to him. See, John's gospel uh, is the gospel that claims Jesus makes God known. John famously begins his gospel with, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and John continues on with, no one has ever seen God. God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. Jesus has made God known to us. What's interesting about the Gospel of John is that even though it proclaims to make God known to us through Jesus, John doesn't really go into and take, a, take us through a bunch of uh, triumphant, dazzling displays of divine glory. Sure, there's the turning water into wine, which is a pretty amazing feat, uh, pretty impressive, but much of John's gospel is a series of encounters that Jesus has with different individuals who often don't recognize Jesus as more than a wonderful teacher. What's so cool, what's so cool about that, though, is that through these encounters, these personal encounters that people have with Jesus, God is made known, made known to us through Jesus Christ. We get to see God. God is revealed through the lens of our humanity in John's Gospel. That's pretty cool. So Jesus gets this visit from this inquisitive but prominent leader, Nicodemus. Old Nick and Jesus have this exchange about being born a new and Nick is is Nicodemus is saying how can an adult be born again how can a grown person be born again and of course Jesus talks to him about being born of the spirit see he sets Nick and us up to see who he is and why he is here Jesus refers to the reading from Numbers that uh, uh, Joy read for us. Jesus, as he's talking to Nicodemus, refers to this reading from Numbers to Moses uh, making this, this brass serpent uh, on, a, on a stick. Uh, and, and, and he says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. What he's talking about, again, is that bronze snake from our reading from Numbers that Moses made to cure people when they got bit by, they got snake bit. They would look up at this, at this uh, uh, staff, this bronze serpent, and be cured because the, the Israelites were out wandering and complaining, as they tended to do, and they were getting attacked by snakes. And they asked God, uh, Moses to call on God to save them. And God instructed Moses on what to do and, and, and carve out this bronze snake and put it on a staff. When people were snake bit, they'd look at the staff, uh, look at the, the bronze snake, and they would be healed. They would be given new life. They would be given new life. Jesus has come to give new life to those bitten by sin. Now today's reading, this gospel reading, contains probably one of the most well-known, most memorized verses in the Bible. John 3, 16. We say it all the time. Sometimes we don't even say the whole thing, for God so loved the world that he gave. A lot of times you just see up on a, on a billboard, John 3, 16, or on a bumper sticker, John 3, 16. It doesn't even get into the details of it because we just, we know that one. We, were, we memorized that in Sunday school and so forth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 
3.16. But so often looking at that, that uh, particular verse, we tend to, to focus on the, the sacrifice aspect somewhat. God gave his only begotten son. Sometimes we talk about the, 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 the focus on the coming to us as Jesus, God coming to us as Jesus, but as important as those key aspects are, and as important as they are, we, we, it's because of that we, that we tend to pay less attention to the very first part of that verse. See, we, 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 we understand and we like and we get to the, the, uh, the I don't know, the, the meat of that verse, that uh, uh, Jesus being begotten, right? We, we, we talk about that. Uh, I mean, that's such an important phrase uh, that, that it made its way into the Nicene Creed even. We talk about Jesus being the Son, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's foundational to our faith, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. God gave his Son as a sacrifice for our sins with this one Verse John three sixteen the it contains the core of the Christian faith. It's obvious why it's so often memorized and displayed and repeated on billboards and so forth, because it's it's a key to our Christian faith. But today I want to draw our attention to those first six words. Those first six words that that sometimes take a back seat to the meat of that verse. Those first six words are, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. In John's gospel, the world is presented as a place of darkness. It's a place of rejection. But it's also the place that Jesus shines his light into. See, the world gets a bad rap. We talk about things being worldly, and that's a, that's a, it has a negative connotation that goes along with it. We say things, say things like, uh, you know, we should not be of the world. The world despised God, but God so loved the world. This Jesus-rejecting world is not rejected by God. That's important too. God so loved the world, so much so, that he would give his only begotten son so that the world would not perish. That very next verse, verse 17, John 3, 17, says, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God loved the world. Even though the world may not deserve it, the Jesus-rejecting dark world, Jesus didn't come to condemn, but to save. Here's God saying to this Jesus-rejecting world, come to me, you're saved. Not condemning, but saving. I met with some folks from our congregation um, earlier this week to talk about the possibility of resurrecting dinner church. It's probably going to happen uh, around Labor Day or after Labor Day is kind of what we're, what we're thinking about. But for those of you that uh, may be new to First United Methodist Church, dinner church is something that we started back in the fall of 2019. Uh, we held church in our fellowship hall but we did it while we ate. We shared a meal together uh, while we had church. We served a meal and, and uh, uh, people gathered. And when we got that started, I went down to, to Christ's Kitchen and started inviting people to come join us on Wednesday evenings for food and for Jesus. Fill your bellies and your spirit on Wednesday evenings. Well, it was going great. Things were, things were going wonderful in this, in this uh, dinner church service. We were meeting new people, making new friends, learning and growing together before COVID came to town and kind of shut our ability to meet together in that manner down. But 
one of the difficult things for me to hear time and time again as we were, were having that service and meeting new people, one of the things that was difficult for me to hear from our new friends was how they had been wounded by the church in the past. Not First United Methodist Church in particular, but the church universal and, and wounded by Christians. There were some that um, came to dinner church uh, that so desperately wanted a relationship with God or wanted to deepen their relationship with God, but, but had been hurt by the church in the past, and, uh, and, and so they were reluctant. They had been hurt so much so that they had, a, had to, to build up their courage to even come to the church and be among other Christians, uh, so much so that, that, that we had some that crawled halfway into a bottle before they would come because they were so hesitant and reluctant about coming to be with us. They weren't sure what to expect, but they were willing to take that chance. They were willing to take that chance, even if they needed to take a drink first. And, and, and uh, those folks, as, as they grew and came, we were less scary. They were less scary. We ceased to be we and they and became us throughout that process. It still gives me chills to think that that First United Methodist Church was a big part of letting others know, especially those that have been wounded by Christians and the church in the past, by letting them know that we don't necessarily feel the same way some other Christians that they have met felt. Now, there could have been a lot of judgment thrown around in a lot of different directions, both directions at dinner church. But instead, I didn't see judgment at our dinner church. I saw compassion. I saw relationships. I saw Jesus Christ on the faces of everyone there. And it didn't matter if you arrived in a Mercedes or went home to your tent. Jesus Christ was manifest in the heart's of the people. The light of Jesus Christ shone in the darkness. In a world that's not always easy. In a world that can beat us down. In that world, Christ is present. Christ is present. Jesus comes calling us to new life. Jesus' ways are not the ways of the world. And although God loves the world. I don't think God loves everything that the world does. God doesn't love the way many of us live our lives. Jesus calls us to repent. Lent is certainly a season of repentance. It's a season of turning from sin. A season of changing the direction of our lives. Let's talk about sin. Sometimes we Methodists uh, get accused of not talking about sin and repentance quite enough. Uh, so let's talk about sin and repentance. Because, I, you know, I often, pre if I'm thinking about sin and repentance, I, I picture a, a preacher in a, you know, a cheap polyester suit with an oversized knot in his tie, and, and he's holding the Bible and pointing his finger and saying, Repent! You know, that's, that's the, the, the image that I get in my head of repent, that, that idea of threatening somebody into repentance, making someone feel condemned for their wrongdoing or feeling uh, called out, caught red-handed in their sin. Repent or there's going to be consequences. Confess your sins or you're going to be punished. Well, that's one way <laughs> to, to do repentance, I guess. But another way Another way, which I think is more along the lines of what Jesus is talking about in our gospel reading today, another way is approaching repentance with the realization that God is not your enemy. God isn't a, a, a sadist waiting for you to mess up so that he can punish you if you don't say, I'm sorry soon enough. I think true repentance, true repentance comes from recognizing how deep and pervasive God's love is for you. 
knowing that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus not to condemn you, but to save you. When we get that through our heads, when we're secure in our relationship with God, when, we're, when, when we have that understanding of how much God truly loves us, we're free to share the truth of ourselves with God. We're coming clean with the one who loves us, honestly confessing our sins, not, not fearing threats, but confessing out of love. That kind of confession is freeing. That's the kind of confession that, that lifts the burden off of your shoulders. That kind of confession acknowledges that Jesus, Jesus, the one who came to save us, is the one who willingly, willingly takes upon himself our repentant sins. Now, we've got three kids. They're all adults now, pretty much. I threw in pretty much. They're adults. Uh, but Lord knows they've been exasperating at times. Um, I'm sure that I've lost my cool with them on more than one occasion. Uh, but as much as they tested my patience, and even still test my patience, I don't think there's anything they could do to stop me from loving them. There's nothing that I can think of that they could do to keep me from wanting the best for them. Nothing that they could do to keep me from wanting to protect their souls. When we understand that God's love is that kind of love that endures, like Paul says in his letter to the Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When we understand that, when we truly believe that, it's like we're able to breathe again. It's like a huge weight has been lifted from our chest. Because whatever trouble existed between you and God, whatever trouble existed between us and God has been fixed by God. I remember, you know, it's, 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 it's the kind of thing that, that uh, we, it, it, it frees us to be able to be who we are and confess who we are to God without having to hide behind who we wish we were or who we would like God to see us as, or the person sitting in the pew next to us would see us as. Having that opportunity, knowing that God loves us so much that we can be open and honest because he loves us. Not here to condemn, but to save us. Now there was a joke back uh, during, during, I think it was the earlier days of COVID. I remember seeing it posted on uh, social media. Um, it was kind of funny, um, a little offensive, but <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, it, it, it was talking about the masks that we wear in church, and, and, and it went something along these lines. And it wasn't talking about First United Methodist Church. Other churches, I'm sure this was talking about. But the joke went along the lines of, some of y'all are complaining about having to wear masks in church, but y'all been wearing masks to church for years. Yeah, ouch. But the good news that Jesus proclaims to Nicodemus in our reading allows us to take off those masks. We don't have to pretend. We're free to tell the truth about ourselves. We aren't always the people we wish that we were. We fail to live up to God's expectations. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and so forth. All of those things that we confess, we can say them and we can mean them because God did not come to condemn us, but to save us. God bless you. Our hymn of response is found in your bulletin Amazing Grace.
Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Um, as you prepare your offering today, I hope you realize by now we're not sending offering plates up and down and through the pews. We have offer offering plates in the narthex. Uh, there are also online opportunities to give on our website at fumcvictoria.com. I would also encourage you, if you have not done so already, uh, download our Be the Church app. Uh, there's ways to give there. Uh, you can also, especially if you're joining us uh, online, uh, you can pull up our uh, worship bulletins through that Be The Church app uh, as well. Um, but as you prepare your offering today, one of the things that we offer uh, is prayers for each other. Uh, prayers of joy and celebration, and also uh, prayers of concern. Uh, so there is a, a number in your bulletin if there are uh, joys and concerns that you would like lifted up in the service today, uh, please text those to area code 361-210-6720, and we will lift them up in prayer today. be seated. Mighty God, we come to you today in prayer, offering our prayers of thanksgiving 
for the mighty gifts and bounty that you have presented us with. Lord, we ask that uh, you lead us and guide us to discern the best use uh, for the, the, the funds and the offering so that we may glorify you in all that we do, being part of that light that you shine into a world of darkness, knowing that you love this world so much. Mighty God, we lift our brothers and sisters in prayer. We lift today uh, Rayburn Haney dealing with diabetes. Lord, we also lift to you those battling cancer and other serious illnesses. We pray for the caregivers, safety and wise choices of those traveling for spring break today, throughout the week. Lord, we also uh, lift to you the family of George Elmer. We lift to you the family of Walter Conzen. Mighty God, we pray for baby Camilla, who was born at 26 weeks. But even in the midst of these difficulties and griefs and mournings and concerns, we also rejoice. We rejoice for the rain and ask that you send a bit more. Lord, we are grateful for all of these. We lift in, your, in our hearts the joys and concerns, not only those that we have texted and spoken, but those that reside in the depths of our hearts, which maybe only we and you know. So we pray them as we join our voices together today with the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as we uh, come to our closing hymn today, uh, I would invite anyone that feels led or called to join with this congregation of First United Methodist Church through membership, come forward during our closing song and we will receive you into membership today. And along those lines, I have to say, uh, this is also something to, to uh, raise a joyful celebration for uh, at the conclusion of the service today. Uh, I'm going to make my way down, so I'm, I'm not being rude by not hanging out, I hope. I don't come across as rude, but I'll be leaving after the service, after the final dismissal, and getting into Ignite because uh, we have a, a young family in there that expressed to me that they would like to join uh, with First United Methodist Church during our Ignite service today. So I'm going to head down there and receive them, uh, the, the Hebners, uh, who have been uh, worshiping with us uh, for a while now. So uh, if you see them or know them, uh, welcome them. If, uh, if you don't know them, make it a point to find them and get to know them and welcome them. But let's stand at this time and sing our closing hymn. <laughs>
would invite you to go ahead and be seated. Um, and actually, Robert, you don't need to sit down. You want to come up here too and and enjoy. Um, I, I want to introduce uh, Barbara Langle, who is uh, coming to us by transfer of membership from Hunt United Methodist Church, um, and. Uh, neighbors with the Tripsons, correct? And, and uh, she has been here since October and has been watching us online, worshiping with us online, and um, is, is uh, uh, like I say, transferring membership from Hunt United Methodist Church uh, here to First United Methodist Church. And we are so happy to have her uh, as a part of our church family. So remember earlier when I said, Try to meet the Heapners if you don't know them already and welcome them and, and so forth. I got a new task for you. Don't forget the old one. Add this one to it. Um, this is Barbara Lingle. Welcome her. Let's welcome her together this morning. And then as I make a mad dash down to our Ignite service uh, to, to uh, receive and welcome the Heapners, you're, you're free and welcome to, uh, to welcome uh, Barbara this morning. And as you do, um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace so that you may go and invite and welcome because God loves you and God loves this world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> 